Welcome. Thank you so much for being here for this very important topic. My name is Indra Lucero. I'm the founder of the Birthrights Bar Association and Elephant Circle and a staff attorney with National Advocates for Pregnant Women. This webinar is part of a webinar series that BRBA and NAPW do regularly on birth justice topics, and these webinars are always free to BRBA members. However, of course, this webinar is also a part of the Black Maternal Health Week, which actually begins tomorrow. Um, I invite those of you who are here, maybe for the first time, to consider becoming a member of BRBA. We love students and allied advocates, as well as attorneys, and having, having us all together can really help us tackle these issues more effectively. Um, members also get a discount on the upcoming Childbirth in the Law Conference, which will be held hopefully at a time when we can all gather in public together in April of 2021 in Chicago, April 16th and 17th. So tomorrow is the start of the third annual Black Maternal Health Week campaign. And one of the goals of the week is deepening the national conversation about Black maternal health. And it could not be more timely as COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting the Black community in terms of both primary and secondary casualties. Not only are more Black people dying from the disease, but as Kimberly Seals Allers tells us, COVID-19 restrictions on birth and breastfeeding are disproportionately harming Black and Native women. So with that, I'd like to ask our panelists to just briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll start to dive into the issues. Maybe Chanel, you could go first. Okay, greetings everyone from this new virtual world that we're in. Um, my name is Chanel Porsche Albert. I am the founder and CEO of Ancient Song Dual Services, and we are a full spectrum uh, doula service organization offering um, direct doula services, uh, doula training, as well as um, workshops. Every year uh, we hold a conference called the Decolonized Birth Conference, which uh, is put together to really center the voices of activists, um, researchers, you know, policymakers, individuals who are in the world and their respective communities who are centering the voices of their community members as experts um, and really trying to find creative ways to address uh, systemic oppression um, you know, for black and brown people uh, in particular. And so, um, yeah. Hi, I'm also a mom of six children. <laughs> important, important. And note. I feel like that's my resume right there. <laughs> right. Everything else don't matter, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm a mom of six um, children. I'm also um, a health policy advocate um, and activist. And I've been doing this work since uh, about 2008. Thank you. Kimberly, maybe you could go next. Hi, I'm Kimberly Seals Allers. I am a journalist by trade and author of five books and um, do a lot of maternal infant health advocacy and strategy work, as well as doing a lot of uh, international public speaking about these issues. Really honored to be a part of this conversation, um, particularly as it relates to Black Maternal Health Week. I am also the founder of a new app that is in development <laughs> called Earth, which is like the word birth, but we drop the B for bias, as we say, um, which is a new tool that we are are developing to directly address bias and racism and care, something that we know we're seeing laid bare right now in, in COVID-19, but something that we know is at the root of the Black maternal mortality crisis, as well as a high rate of Black infant death. So excited to be in this conversation today. Thank you. Jamara. Hey everyone, my name is Jamara Amani and I am a community midwife. I am a mother of four. Um, I practice midwifery in Florida. I am the director of Southern Birth Justice Network and the co-founder of National Black Midwives Alliance. Um, my work centers around direct service midwifery, um, advocating for change of laws that impact people's access to midwifery and doula care, um, and education, educating people about what their rights are. Um, I'm also one of the authors of the Birth Justice Framework, um, which has been around since 2011 um, and really serves as a tool um, to assist with movement building around the rights of pregnant and birthing people. Thank you all so much. So 
I think at first glance, it's interesting to note that we're talking about the, the rights that pregnant people have during a pandemic today. And I'm the only attorney. And I <laughs> wanted to just highlight that that is actually by design. Um, because I think more often than not directly impacted people are more aware than experts about both what the limits of laws and rights are, but also how to advocate for human rights despite those limitations. So for example, Chanel, you reached out to me on March 17th, you know, pre which seems like eons ago. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, at that time you said, you know, people should know the realities and we can balance with practical understandings of what they can control. So I wonder if you can just talk about what inspired you to reach out, what were you seeing, what were you thinking? Yeah, so um, Ancient Song is located in Brooklyn, New York, and we serve parts of Northern New Jersey as well, but we serve all of um, New York City, yeah. um, all five boroughs, and so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I want okay, yeah. one second. <laughs> Um, so that being said, um, we were getting a lot of phone calls around some of the laws that, uh, pertain to, yeah. okay. <laughs> we were getting, <laughs> we were getting some, um, phone calls around what does it mean to, um, birth right now during this time, right? And so given maternal mortality rates and how, you know, the conversation prior to COVID-19 was really focused on uplifting the voices of Black pregnant people um, and letting them know what their rights were in terms of bodily autonomy and a human rights framework within the birth room. So now what does that mean in the context of now we have a crisis situation and understanding that Black and Brown people, if they're not already seen and heard, how that can be further exaggerated um, in these types of situations. And so really wanting to um, center the voices of individuals who were like calling frantic, you know, like anxious, you know, before conversations were around, you know, do I need to get a medical proxy? Like, you know, is it better for me to have a home birth? Now it was, I don't want to go to the hospital. Can I have a home birth? Understanding like within New York City, um, we only have 20 home birth midwives who are actually working, right? Um, CPMs, because of the educational restrictions, are not allowed to work in New York City. Um, we only have one freestanding birthing center, right? And so, like, for a low-risk pregnant person to go into a hospital setting and have to um, face the different types of um, restrictions that they have in place and understanding what they are, right, given the fact that um, there's not proper PPE, you know, um, personal protective equipment for individuals, for providers, as well as being able to pass that on to support persons. You know, now, you know, it went from um, individuals having, uh, being able to bring their doula into a room to saying nobody was going to come into the room to an executive order having to be put in place, um, saying that you have to allow at least one support person in the room. But given the fact that within the context of New York City, there is no universal standards for uh, maternal health, and each hospital kind of operates independently, like folks were and continue to be in this cycle of like, well, what are my rights? Like, what can I, you know, if I bring in a birth plan, does that even matter? Do I, you know, does my bodily autonomy even matter given the fact that I might be birthing alone and, you know, or my support person who I thought was going to be there now has to be someone else. And they don't necessarily have like that, the information or the resources to provide, you know, evidence-based information so they can make an informed decision about their care. And so I really wanted to, you know, I reached out to you all because, you know, we've worked in the past together, but also understanding like from a law perspective, people need to know what the, what the parameters are of what their rights are. You know what I mean? Like saying like, listen, no matter what, these are your inalienable rights that you have and those need to be upheld so that we can really um, push to see the humanity in one another, which I think, you know, um, when there's a crisis situation given on top of structural oppression and racism, there has a tendency to really, you know, and also like the context of like black people don't feel pain. Um, you know, that all of that stuff becomes super, you know, compounded and you're, you're in this place of like, okay, so I'm already not seen or heard now. What does that mean? So, you know, really wanted to like being able to have a place where people have resources to, to, to tap into um, in a way that really centered them. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. And I, I know right around the same time, Kimberly, you started your reporting. Uh, we probably talked shortly after Chanel and I did. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you learned and what, what your article talks about? Yeah, your most I think it's your most recent article. Yeah, probably my second recent article. Okay. <laughs> but I think it was, thank you so much. I mean, it was really interesting for me because I, like many people, assumed that there was a legal right um, and that there may have been a legal precedent for this not to happen and was completely floored and, and flabbergasted and all the other words to find out that there actually isn't. And I think that, you know, what we realized is that, um, you know, some of the things that we had relied on to help support our bodily autonomy and what we perceive to be human rights, whether it's a birth plan or a doula, all those things were being stripped away. And in, in the space of that, there was literally nothing. And so I remember in our conversations, you know, us having like, you know, me asking three times, right? Like, are you, are you really saying there's no legal right for us to have somebody with us during birth? And, um, and then we talked about the legal precedent and that it was really around visit, you may have a visitor and that visitation kind of came through some of the LGBTQI advocacy, but in terms of birthing, there was no legal precedent. And that was deeply distressing and an eye-opening moment about the ways that we have, you know, failed to create the legislation that we need to support ourselves through these processes. I think we've been great at creating language. We've been great at creating advocacy and advocacy tools. But around the legal precedent, I think this is one of the, the kind of the gaping eye-opening moments, even for me, where we need to make sure that we close this gap going forward. And so while I was in the space of reporting this piece that really looked at, um, as Chanel mentioned, we know that this history is that Black and Brown women have been disproportionately mistreated in the healthcare system overall. And so now what happens when people who we know are disproportionately being mistreated are now facing um, individuals who are obviously hyper-stressed. They're, they're, they're facing situations where the people who we have supported to be there for them are now being excluded from the process. Um, and so it became only, it became very clear that there was only going to be a potentially even more damage to those who were already being damaged with the system when it was operating under normal capacity and normal stress. And so I was deeply concerned about that. And, you know, in the reporting really wanted to get back to the root issue, which really was around this medicalization of birth and the criminalization of midwives, which historically has forever changed um, our birthing experience here in the US, but also is showing why, as Chanel was saying, people were desperate for midwives. You know, when I didn't even realize, I think of New York as a progressive state. I live in New York City as well and had no clue that not all midwives are legal and that you can't necessarily always get a home birth here in New York. And so there was so much around this legal landscape that I feel that women don't know anything about because perhaps we've taken these options for granted. We haven't valued them enough to push through to make sure they are, they are in place. And I hope that that is one of the important and many uh, if there are any silver linings from this pandemic that we will continue to push for that because we've seen what happens to women's rights when we don't actually have any legal precedent. Exactly. And that's why when Chanel first reached out, I, I, I said my only hesitation about doing a webinar like this is that I, I've got nothing but bad news. Um, and I, of course, that week in particular had been having so many conversations, you know, having to say, yeah, there, there isn't a lot legally that people can do to push back against, you know, support person restrictions. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of, you know, the whole legal landscape. Um, but I think what ultimately excited me and inspired me after talking to you all was that it, the problem even begs the question, what are our rights for? What do they do? You know, it starts to be sort of a philosophy of rights conversation, which I want to just shout out Kiara Bridges and um, her work in general, but in particular her, her book, The Poverty of Privacy Rights. Um, to, to, if you're interested in diving into the philosophy of rights, I recommend her introduction. 
Um, and one of the things that I learned from her introduction is that, you know, the question is really, do you claim a right that does not yet exist in order to usher that right into existence? Or do you assert that you do not have rights as a critique of the status quo? And that's kind of my segue to you, Jamara. You know, we actually talked last year um, about your forthcoming Birth Justice Bill of Rights. And I think of that Birth Justice Bill of Rights as being more in line with the first option, claim a right that does not yes, yet exist in order to usher that right into existence. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Great segue. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's what that we've always done as a people um, is to demand rights that we know are our human rights, that we know are our God-given rights, that we know that because we, you know, live and breathe, <laughs> there are just certain things that every human should have access to and should have the right to be able to do and to be supported by their you know, fellow humans in doing. Um, and that's how many of our legal rights have come into existence, is that we have declared them before they were the law. And so I think it is the same thing with birth justice, is that um, the Birth Justice Bill of Rights exists because we know that many of these things are not currently supported, um, as Chanel and Kimberly so eloquently spoke about, and so what we want to be able to do is to assert that, you know, these are our rights and that, um, you know, they need to be enforced. They need to be upheld in every environment that we're in. So I'm going to try to do a screen share. Um, oh, I might not be able to do that because I'm not the host. I think I, let me see if I can quickly okay. on the fly change that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the meantime, I'll just read the, the intro. Um, the Birth Justice Bill of Rights you is your- You should have the power now, by the way. Okay. <laughs> to know your rights and advocate for the respectful care that you deserve. Health disparities do not exist in a vacuum, but are a reflection of the power disparities in our society that must shift in order for us to be healthy. The historical exploitation and abuse of Black folks in the medical industrial complex has implications for health outcomes. Um, the Birth Justice Bill of Rights um, is centered on Black mamas and non-binary transgender parents on the realities of our lives. So let me see if I can do this screen share thing. Just bear with me a second. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome. So let me see if I can make it bigger. Get rid of that. Okay. <laughs> so it says, as a Black preconception, pregnant, birthing, or postpartum person, I have the right to culturally sensitive and systemically aware healthcare providers that have been trained on microaggressions, anti-racism, and implicit bias. Um, I have the right to have my healthcare providers recognize that the particular history of Black people involves medical abuse, exploitation, and discrimination, and that this generational trauma affects my ability to trust the healthcare system. It is essential that healthcare providers give special attention to building trust. Um, I have the right to holistic, compassionate care that incorporates my healthcare values. I have the right to respect for my personal beliefs, cultural traditions, and those of my ancestry. I have the right to develop a support system that feels safe and empowering. I have the right to have my racial identity recognized and respected in all care settings. I have the right to respect and consideration for my intersecting identities, that is race, gender, identity, sexuality, disability status, LGBTQ status, socioeconomic status, insurance, and immigrant status. I have the right to have my life preserved and wellness uplifted by my family, community, and the state, including the right to be protected from domestic, state, or obstetric violence. I have the right to thorough review of my health history, including pre-existing health conditions and risk factors and to be involved in developing a care plan. I have the right to include my familial and intimate relationships in my care, including non-heteronormative partners and extended family. 
I have the right to preventive postpartum health services, including culturally appropriate home visits and mental health wellness services. I have the right to comprehensive doula birth companion support for advocacy, accountability, and comfort. I have the right to access healthy foods, vitamins, and clean water, including transportation um, to obtain if I live in a food desert. I have the right to stress reduction practices, including self-care and detoxing white supremacy and patriarchy. I have the right to share decision-making in all healthcare options, including comprehensive sex education, preconception and interconception care, pregnancy termination, prenatal care, birth and postpartum care. I have the right to healthcare from the provider of my choice in the setting that I prefer, including but not limited to midwives, midwives family care practitioners, obstetricians, birth centers, home births, et cetera. I have the right to manage my labor according to the evidence base of physiologic birth, including but not limited to birth environment, principles of non-invasive intervention, movement positioning, eating and drinking, and compassionate care. I have the right to access lactation support, including prenatal lactation education, immediate skin-to-skin -skin contact with my baby, and lactation consult within the first 12 hours after birth. I have the right to be heard and listened to by all care providers and to change providers if this does not happen. I have the right to know my rights, including birth justice bills of rights, young mother's bill of rights, universal declaration of human rights, reproductive rights frameworks. I have the right to paid parental leave from work, even if I am partially employed, unemployed, undocumented, or fleeing an abusive relationship. And I have the right to never surrender my inalienable human right to bodily autonomy. These rights should be upheld and demanded wherever Black pregnant people are and should be compensated by social services, including to the principles of birth justice, reproductive justice, community building, and self-determination. Woohoo! <laughs> so, you know, as a lawyer, I'm seeing these and, you know, it's like, wow, this, the vision captured by this Bill of Rights is so far away from the, the legal universe where I work and toil away trying to, you know, connect people to meaningful rights. Um, and I think the truth is, personally, I don't think we have to choose between, you know, ushering in rights by speaking them out and critiquing the system and articulating, look, we don't have these rights as a way of saying, also demanding that the rights be manifest. Um, I think it's just, you know, thinking about who our audience is and what we're trying to do in the moment. Um, so I'm curious, Chanel, Kimberly, as you see the, this Birth Justice Bill of Rights, you know, what, would, what are you seeing as the gaps between that vision and the folks you're hearing from and talking to? And, and how might we narrow that gap? Yeah, I mean, I, um, Jamara, those are, you know, what you've compiled and put together <laughs> um, is truly exceptional and it's beautiful and powerful. And I want to um, uplift that and really center that um, first and foremost in saying, you know, give thanks for being able to do that. Um, I mean, for me as someone who, um, who is a doula um, and who attends births, um, maybe not as frequently as I used to, but also as a health policy advocate, really looking at how um, this framework really would need to be moved to um, a legislative platform in order for those things to really be upheld and uplifted, right? Because I've realized the, the connection between the reality of what actually happens at bedside, um, you know, and, and, and being in, um, entrenched within like certain situations. So for instance, like, you know, myself and others, um, came together and created the Respectful Care at Birth um, document that is used within New York City. And while the document in and of itself, you know, centers the basic human rights of individuals and bodily autonomy, you know, that doesn't mean anything if the institutions which um, individuals access don't follow those things, the providers don't have the education around what it means to uplift that. Um, and, you know, policies that are put in place are not universal. And so what I've really um, begin to notice is that um, in terms of uh, what is actually done, you know, we don't have policies that are put in place 
um, when it comes to, to maternal health care or reproductive health care that are standard across the board. And so you continuously see these institutions who are creating and developing policies as they go along. And so like one person, you know, I might be telling per one person one thing and then they're being told something else. And then the next person being said, well, you know, based on the high volume of the hospital, like all of that is cute, theoretically, but we, we can't do any of that. You know what I mean? So like really starting to think about how we can um, make a, you know, develop legislative policy that is put in place that talks about um, making universal policies and practices when it comes to the standardization of birth rights within, um, within healthcare systems. Because if we don't have that, you know what I mean? Like people will read, you know, the, the rights, the bill of rights that are, are put together and be like, yeah, but this is what I was told. Like, this is what I have, you know what I mean? And take it from a literal context. And then when it comes to the application, then that's not necessarily their reality. And that's what we also tend to see with like birth plans, right? Because people will write these birth plans up and they're like, oh yeah, like this is what I want. And then the hospital's like, okay, and <laughs> you know, like that's not within the structure of what I'm able to do as a provider. And so really trying to find tangible ways to really put those things that Jamara has taken her time to put together into um, some real policy changes that can shift that so that they, they could become actuality. You know what I mean? And not just here on a, on a smaller level, but I'm thinking more internationally too, where, you know, these are, these are, these are women's rights. These are rights that, you know, and, and people's rights. These are human rights. These are like, if I woke up this morning and I breathe and I'm breathing in the air, then I have the right to these things. Um, and so really putting those things into fruition is something that we're going to all have to collectively push forward to, um, to make actually happen. Yeah, and I will acknowledge it's absolutely a global issue. I was just on a call yesterday uh, to try and get folks together and address this same topic we're talking about today as it applies all over the world. Um, and also, I wanted to thank you. I wanted to add, I mean, also just wanted to amplify how comprehensive and beautiful and visionary that the, the, the Bill of Rights is, Jamar. Thank you for putting that together. Um, and, you know, when Indra was asking what stands in the way between that vision that we all hold dear, that should be, and where we are now, the two things that came to mind for me were definitely racism and power. Um, and so when we think about the power dynamics that exist within institutions, right, and that hospitals, unfortunately, you know, they become the most powerful uh, voice or, or, or entity in that situation. And so even in places like Chanel is saying in New York City here, where we, oh, let me put on my charger, sorry. <laughs> Computer's telling me I got to charge that we have a patient bill of rights or that we've put time into looking at these issues. Even that was, you know, was not helpful for many women here in our own city. And so kind of understand the power of who who actually is the, in the position to make that real? Who actually is in the position to, to, to determine what is valid and what is not valid is really, really critical. And I think that's what um, that we have to get to is kind of figuring out, well, you know, who is it who really has the power? And unfortunately, it's not always us. And what we've seen in these situations is that when those, when they are under a pandemic or stress or whatever, their immediate reaction is not to center mothers and babies, is not to center our individual rights, um, is to focus on what is best for them, whether that's from a legal perspective, whether that's from you know, limiting liability, whether that's for convenience. You know, when we look at why we have so many C-sections even before this, right? It was like, well, doctors got to get back to the golf course and got time they're waiting for you to go through labor. So like convenience has been centered, so many things, but not women. Um, and, and certainly not black women and what's in the best interests of our bodies and that mother-child dyad, which needs to be centered. And so it is a a deep and cavernous gap um and and i agree with chanel like we need to try to think about how do we do create how do we create that legislation how do we move what we know should be in place to what is actually in place um so that we don't have to be in this situation again but if we don't address the power imbalances and not ask answer those tough questions about who actually has power over us during birth and how we can hold those institutions accountable or 
get those institutions to be a part of creating um, something that they themselves will hold themselves to, it will, it's, it's going to continue to be all on women. Mm -hmm. It's going to continue mm -hmm. to be all on us. And mm -hmm. that also doesn't seem right. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, it's, it's almost about priorities, even in the face of a crisis. Tr you know, it just, it changes, it changes certain dynamics, but still we can prioritize. And what I love about the vision of your, your Bill of Rights, for example, is what if we had to prioritize things, even in the face of a crisis, How, you know, what would we have to rearrange? Sure, but still the, the thought exercise of having to imagine rearranging things in order to achieve those priorities as, a, as opposed to the set of priorities that are, we're currently rearranging things for. Um, Jamara, I wonder what you think about that gap and closing the gap in the value of the Bill of Rights. Well, um, first thing I want to say is listen to Black midwives, <clears throat> as 100% of that Bill of Rights comes out of um, the way that all the Black midwives that I know, particularly those who practice in out-of-hospital settings, um, are what we already do. Um, you know, I learned from Mama Claudia Booker. I learned from Mama Shafia Monroe, Mama Saran Henderson, um, you know, Mama Sheila Watson. Like, those are my teachers that taught me respectful maternity care that taught me the values of birth justice before we were calling it that. Um, and, and that's been ingrained in the care of black midwives, um, particularly, like I said, in home-based care for many, many generations. We have stood in that gap. We have been the ones that have taken care of folks in our communities who, um, you know, are rejected and marginalized and don't have access to the best care. Um, you know, we have ensured that people birth on their own terms and that the family is involved and that support systems are developed and that people have access to services and food and, you know, honoring that golden hour after birth, that connection, um, helping people to meet the challenges of breastfeeding and chest feeding, which we know will come up. Like people don't quit breastfeeding because it's not possible for them. They quit because they don't have the level of support that they need. So all of those things are things that midwives and particularly black midwives who have been really on the ground, you know, um, front lines in our communities for so long have understood for a long time. And, and then, you know, when we look at the ways that those midwives are marginalized within their own um, field of practice, right, among, the, in the field of midwifery, um, in the field of um, maternity care, um, in the legal system, you know, midwifery being criminalized, um, not being covered by insurance in many cases. Most of the U.S. home birth is not covered by insurance. Um, you know, all of those, all of those gaps, I think, particularly when we're talking about the health of Black mothers um, and changing health disparities, we have to include um, and center Black midwives and listen to what Black midwives have been saying for a very long time. And we have to shore up the Black midwife workforce, really. We have to support students. We have to create more educational pathways. We have to make sure that folks can get paid and that you know, they have sick leave and um, retirement plans and, and ways to be sustainable if we want to really build the profession. Because I get calls every day of the week from people looking for a black midwife and many of them either are not in my area and can't find one in their area so i try to refer them or um you know there's capacity issues where you know all the midwife practices are full particularly now with the flood of people trying to leave hospital care um you know one of the birth centers that i work with the, the practice volume has doubled and there's just, there's a finite amount of midwives that can serve, you know, the people that want um, the care. And so we have to build, also build the workforce and create more opportunities for there to be more providers that are offering this particular type of care that is in line with this vision that we have. Um, and our financial systems have to support that. So yeah, definitely we need to, um, you know, elevate the, the Bill of Rights to be a legal document. 
um, that is pushing, you know, our legislators to create policy. Also, not just legislation, also local entities. Hospital policies sometimes can shift and change before the laws change. Um, and so, you know, that local advocacy really matters too. And I think, you know, I struggle too with that whole, like, do we, you know, empower people by giving them this bill of rights and then they go into their hospital birth and they get disappointed because these aren't actually their rights. Um, and so I think that's where the, the people that stand in the gap really matter, like the doulas, to be educated on what the bill of rights are and to understand also how to navigate those hospital policies so we can get you maybe 10 of these rights, <laughs> maybe five of them right now while we're still pushing for more of them. Um, and also managing expectations of their clients. So I think it's like a both and approach and like a collective community care approach to get this done. I wanna do a couple things. First, I wanna just note that Great Minds Think Alike, the um, National Association to Advance Black Birth is also launching a Black Birthing Bill of Rights. And I believe they have a webinar about that next week on the 13th. So check out National Association to Advance Black Birth. Um, if folks want to put questions in the chat box or the q a i'll try with my limited multitasking abilities to track that um and then my next question for you all is since you know midwives have been decimated from our system deliberately and now not everybody can, not everybody can have their black midwife that they should i wonder how we might essentially put a black midwife in everybody's pocket you know what are the ways that people can take some of those messages with them that could be helpful in the face of these barriers any ideas strategies um well i'll say that i think it starts with uplifting the midwives that are already centralized within your communities first um, and helping them to build um, adequate infrastructure so that they can, port to, can support themselves because ultimately the midwives that are there are not only like, you know, providing healthcare services in terms of reproductive health, but they also do other services like well woman care, um, you know, GYN services, um, but are oftentimes under financial strains, you know, due to, you know, the limitations that have been, you know, placed on, upon them. And so, really, you know, going to them and speaking to them and asking them, like, what does that look like for you to be centered within your own healthcare, right? To be centered within your own institutional framework, like, what does that look like to build that, start in and build that out, right? And so, like, supporting the ones that are there while actively um, pushing for, you know, building up the education of those who are interested in being in this work, because not everybody wants to be necessarily a certified nurse midwife and cer certified professional midwives, you know, they can practice from certain states to states. Like, for instance, like, you know, I live in New Jersey, CPMs can work right across the water in New York City, not, not the case. We have a law where educational restrictions were, um, have been restricted, excuse me, opened up in New York City, but that's only for out-of-state CPMs. So what does that mean for the infrastructure that's currently within the state? You know what I mean? Because there are CPMs that live in, live there who are ready to do the work. And so really wanting to um, think about like those different structures that are, are put in place, um, providing educational resources, so in terms of funding, financially. Um, and there are some bills that have come out um, but a lot of what has happened, you know, based on COVID-19, so for instance, uh, Rep Underwood um, came out with a mommy bus, and in that mommy bus that was developed, you know, it talked about centering the, the education of midwifery and uplifting and providing financial services. Um, and so hopefully, like, once some of this has, you know, tapered down in terms of the, the pandemic and folks are able to really get back on the floor and, and hustle, like, they can push and uplift that so that those things can happen. But I think that it's, it's really going to take, you know, it's always been community centered <laughs> and it's always going to be community. And we really have to rely on community to like really uphold that because midwives can't do it by themselves. Doulas can't do it by themselves. It really takes us having this like framework that where we understand that we're all interconnected. You know what I mean? Like we're all part of that source. And if we're not 
willing to do that together, then it's, it's not going to mean anything. It can't just be like certain advocates and groups of individuals. It has to be all of us because at some point in time, somebody's a grandma, an auntie, you know, somebody's friends giving birth, like a cousin, somebody, somebody's getting pregnant somewhere. You know what I mean? And so like in, in that, you know, we need to be able to have, they need to be able to have resources and we need to know that we have to support one another because it, it takes us collectively working together. Well, I'm just going to say, Kimberly, I think one of the things that we can do is what you're doing. You know, reporting is just so important. Having information. But maybe you want to say more about that. Yeah, no, I think that, you know, for me, it's, it is time to, to make a little bit of, of, of noise about these issues. And, you know, I've written also about how I think anger is, is, is a good tool and has served us well in our history. And that is time to get a little angry, a little loud about what we're seeing happening. You know, we're sharing these stories. We're seeing these stories. There was a, a piece uh, yesterday, in, and I think it's called The Cut, um, and people were just heartbroken. I'm like, yeah, but heartbreak is not the end game here. You know, mm. we have to begin to use, turn our anger into action and to start to actually think about the things that Chanel is saying. How do we now institutionalize? How do we now start holding these, whoever it needs to be um, accountable? How do we now start breaking down these power structures that have criminalized midwives um, for, no, for no reason, right? Um, and so, we really have to use this moment because I believe strongly that we have a, a, a small window um, to be able to actually turn this, this tragedy into something that we can learn from and move on before mm -hmm. people get way too back into business as usual. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the most important thing that we can do for our, ourselves and continue to, you know, help each other. As Chanel is also saying, you know, this, this has always been community centered. So what are the tools and what, what do we know? One of the things that I've been talking about even amongst our breastfeeding community is that many times um, there are like we have a you know kind of chain right so there are people working in hospital settings and people working in community settings well how are people working in hospital settings those those nurses and others who are supportive how are they sharing what they know about the culture not, mm. not the policies mm -hmm. and there's no laws, but how are they sharing what they know about the culture and letting that trickle down to the people in communities mm -hmm. so that information can be shared there? Because I get a message every day about people who know who's good and bad without using, you know, such this drastic frames in hospitals. And how are we helping people to have that practical information, right? Mm -hmm. And to say, if you're at this hospital, you should know to ask for this nurse or don't go with this doctor or whatever. And this is actually, you know, what the Earth app is all about. How do we create a system, mm. a public system where we could see and know who's giving good care and who doesn't. But right now, I think it's really important that we bridge this gap and that those who, um, are in a hospital setting and have the ability take that very seriously to help bring trickle down that information to the community level you know even if it is by secret text I, I get them all the time um, and that we can actually share what we know so that people can survive like this is this is insane what's going on and the text messages that I'm seeing often from women giving birth unfortunately many times they are still being yelled at even by nurses and so when they are saying to people People, particularly black women oh you, you're not alone the nurses there well sorry to say not every person in that room um, is, is is going to be supportive and so how do we find those who we know will actually advocate for you help for you at least respect one of those rights mm -hmm. um, throughout this and how do we share that now is that's what I'm asking people to do as well and asking those who see themselves as allies to use their power and what they know about the cultures in some of these places and to share those those uh, those insights with others mm -hmm. that's so helpful and addresses one of the questions we got which is just how docs and MDs can kind of help um, so I think, I hope, I hope that answer is heard, that folks who are inside systems can help get good information out to people. Um, and that's one piece of good news that I have. One of, one of the clearest, strongest rights in this area that people really do have is the right to informed consent. Uh, the U.S. Constitution establishes that people have a right to refuse treatment, even life-saving treatment. Um, so that's a, very, that's a very strong right. Are hospitals good at it? No. Do people have their informed consent rights violated regularly? Yes. 
is there a good way to redress those violations? No. But nonetheless, rarely on these issues do we have something as solid as a good constitutional decision. And we actually do. Um, I think partly in this area, it's about not even knowing what information to demand. And I do think your Earth app is a great step in the right direction, which also reminds me, we'll make sure and share these resources with folks who registered for this webinar. So we'll make sure folks can get access to your app, your articles, um, Jamara, your Birth Justice Bill of Rights. Um, so look for that following the webinar. Um, Jamara, before we move on to the next question, did you wanna say anything about that one? Um, <clears throat> well, we're actually working on an app too that's called Birthright. Um, and the idea is that everyone should have a virtual doula, um, even if they don't have access. People, some people can't find doulas, you know, um, but also the just knowing your rights, like those rights being in the app. Um, one thing I've seen from evidence-based birth, which I think is helpful, is um, sample informed consent forms. Like I saw one circulating recently around um, the separation of babies from the birthing person and that, um, and people, you know, being able to go in with this form saying, I'm aware of all of the risks of holding my baby and I still want to hold my baby. Um, now, will a hospital respect that if their policy is we're separating newborns? Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I think having those kinds of advocacy tools that we can put in people's hands, like apps and forms that they can, um, you know, be prepared with um, is really important. And then I think also when we're talking about um, folks that are marginalized, we also have to address the digital divide and how even with apps and forms and websites and webinars and Zooms, there's still gonna be a lot of folks in our communities that we don't reach. So my question is always like, how are we reaching those people who tend to be the most likely to have their rights um, you know, violated? So we're, we're winding up. I wanna do a number of things. So just help me keep track of all the threads. We have one more good question I wanna to pose to you. Um, Another person asked about whether we're tracking violations of folks' rights. Um, and I'll send around a link about that. Elephant Circle is actually tracking those violations related to COVID. Um, equity uh, as an additional thread, even when community birth is being implemented. And I just, I'm so excited to share with you all and with the public in general this resource in line with what you're talking about, with what you're envisioning in terms of the app, Jamara, um, National Advocates for Pregnant Women and the Birth Rights Bar Association have finally released this great resource that I think will be useful to folks in dealing with these things. Um, just a sec. And this will send the links around as well. So here's, here's the link where it's available right now. And to get a sense of some of the things in this resource, we really wanted to make it useful, tangible. It does talk about some of the legal background, you know, that you can dive in more or less. Um, but it also provides really practical suggestions for if you're in the middle of a situation, what are some of the things that you can do if you're experiencing a violation of your rights, here's you know six suggestions that we have. Um, there's also just big conceptual principle ideas that we've talked about today, just that whether your rights are protected by society or the government or not, everyone has them. And some strategies for what happens if you do experience a mistreatment or violation during care. These are nine ideas. Um, so, of course, these are just a few pages of this resource, but I'm excited for folks to be able to, to use this and give us feedback about what works and what you'd like to see more of. So, I think we have time for one last question. Um, 
and I'm sorry for the other questions we won't get to address, but somebody asked, I think it's a good question, how can we help make sure people have good information about COVID without unduly creating more fear? Thoughts about that? Can you ask the question again? I had a child in my ear. <laughs> Let me just... Um, dun, dun, dun. What are ways to educate about COVID-19 without creating more fear? And I'd put, you know, what are ways to educate about the realities that people are facing in systems without creating more fear? So, um, oh, go ahead, Jamara. So I think we've seen this already with um, all of the news around the Black maternal health epidemic, um, the Black maternal mortality epidemic. I've heard from people over the last year or two years, really, since um, there's been a lot more media attention to the issue that, um, <clears throat> particularly I've heard from a lot of young Black women that are like, yeah, I was going to have a baby, but now that I know that I'm more likely to die, I don't know about all that. Um, you know, I've heard from people that are just, you know, they'll call me after their pregnancy test or in their first trimester and they're terrified because they don't know what they don't know. They don't know, you know, what the risks really are. Um, and so I think that it is really great that Black maternal mortality um, got a front seat in the news for, you know, a period of time um, and that there was a lot more reporting around it there were celebrities talking about it um, and that people started paying attention. Um, and I also feel like for those of us that are really the advocates and that are in the movement, we have to be really careful about the language that we use and about you know, how we um, you know, give that information to people in a way that doesn't make them just be like, okay, you know, womb shop is closed, <laughs> that's it. Um, and of course, if that's what they want to do, then they have the right to do that and we should support them in doing that. But if it's from a fear-based place, is it really from an honest place? And so, um, and so what we've been doing um, at Southern Birth Justice Network and National Black Midwives Alliance is really focusing a lot on what folks can do to stay healthy um, and really educating people about strategies and having space for people to express those fears so that, um, it's not like you read the news and then you don't have a way, a place to put it or a way, you know, to go um, with the information. I think community connection really matters um, when it comes to things like this, um, particularly with COVID-19 because the information is changing so quickly. You know, something you read two days ago might not even be relevant anymore in terms of hospital policies or vertical transmission or breast milk, you know, um, those, those recommendations and those guidelines and those, the research is just changing so rapidly. Um, so I think that, um, you know, having organizations and community kind of centers, if we can call them like virtual community centers right now, that are like trusted places where people can go for information um, is really important. And that we, um, like I said earlier, make sure that we are using a variety of ways to connect with people that address the digital divide. I find that most of my young mamas that I care for um, don't have the ability to download Zoom on their phone or have a lot of challenges with it, um, but they are on WhatsApp, they are on TikTok, you know, they're on IG. So um, finding, finding like people where they are so that we can get good information to them, I think is really important. And also understanding the ways that that we access information um, is, is really community-based for a lot of our folks. So there's been a huge disruption um, because of social distancing in terms of like the underground news networks of how people you know, get information. Not everybody's watching the news or has access to do that. Um, or they might not watch it because they feel triggered by it. And so they might get their information from you know, their friends at school or you know, family members that they see for Sunday dinners. Um, and so you know, figuring out how to stand in those gaps of the, you know, what has been disrupted based on our social distancing guidelines and how do we keep people connected 
um, so that when those fears come up, we can address them with good information. Um, and, and so I think there's like a balance between, I saw um, P. P. Diddy is doing like a black people family meeting around COVID-19. Um, and, you know, he was, he was on the, the video talking about ring the alarm, ring the alarm, which I thought was really good in the sense of getting people's attention and then like backing it up with information and also like now we're going to come together and strategize. So it's not just like ring the alarm, be afraid, but ring the alarm so we can come together and come up with community based solutions. Thank you. And also, I would just wanted to piggyback on what Jamar was saying, because it's so powerful. I mean, I too have also been very concerned about balancing this narrative between the doom and gloom and, and us and people feeling hopeless and giving up. And, and I've written about this extensively as well Is like, you know, fear is a tool and fear, particularly for black women. Black women and Black people has been used as a tool to, to control us for, for, for since we've been here, right? There's a reason why they lynched us publicly to let us know that that was not to be done, right? And it was a way to, to incite fear and use fear as a tool to control. And so I think that it's also important that as we work on giving people to think about what they can control, um, is that one of the things that we're going to have to just deal with the harsh reality that during this time, People may be harmed, but we are also in the healing work and we can't forget that. And so we may not be able to prevent the harm. Mm -hmm. it is, there are bad things happening that even with the best of tools, you may not be able to avoid. And that's just an unfortunate reality of this expletive situation, right? Yeah. But we can be prepared to heal we can be prepared to heal. And so for those of us who see ourselves as activists and advocates in this birthing work on the breastfeeding side or whatever side or all the sides that we have to, you know, really start to focus on what are the resources for healing that we have. And to Jamara's point, some of those resources are not possible because of the physical distancing, but in terms of mental health um, referrals, mental health apps, all the virtual support for that. And so I think that while we have been paying a lot of attention on prevention, which is really important, but just may not be possible for everyone at this time. We can be prepared for the healing. And that's where I think we also need to be able to tell women, and I have sometimes your best advice is get out that hospital as quickly as you can, girl. Have a vaginal birth and try to be out. <laughs> and then let the healing work begin where you can come back and access other resources. So also just want to say that this does not have to end with the birthing experience and that although many will be harmed, that we can continue the work to heal them um, uh, through, through many ways, including supporting their breastfeeding journeys, helping them to talk to others, using the tactics that you had raised in, in, the, in the resource, and that um, right now we have to also see ourselves as healers. Thank yeah, I just, so much. Wanted to, I just wanted to leave off with saying, you know, in everything that I've done, um, it has always been focused on offering a level of transparency. So really being honest and upfront with people about what they may experience um, when they go into these institutions, but also wanting to center hope, right? Because as you, you know, both have um, really, you know, hit a, a nail on the head is that a lot of times, you know, all this information that's coming out, people become overwhelmed and over inundated with a lot of missed messaging and it's really about us centering that hope you know letting people know that they are seen that they're heard and that there are people that are actually out there that genuinely care about them and are, are working every day tirelessly and it's not just about the people and the faces that you see every day it's about the folks who you don't see every day who are doing this work who are in the trenches and who are providing support you know what i mean um on an interpersonal level and even putting themselves sometimes in harm's way in order to be able to do that and so really wanting to lift them up and center them and, and let folks know, like, you know, it only takes one voice to actually change something, you know what I mean? And, and to stand up for truth and rights. And I think a lot of it is about us standing up for truth and rights and, and understanding that, um, and we want to, you know, you, you can't ask for liberation and respect and all those things for one set of people and not lift up a whole set of people at the same time. And, you know what I mean? And really start to center the humanity in one another and see that, you know, in, in our everyday application, in our, in our interpersonal interactions with one another, but then on our global and community level interactions with one another. Thank you so much. Well, I, I feel hopeful after talking with all of you and with seeing all the great resources in the chat. Again, we'll, we'll get you some links to make sure everybody has access to these great resources and the recording of this webinar.
thank you all. Hang in there. And I believe in our ability to thrive. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Happy Black Maternal Health Week to everyone. Yes. <laughs> Plug in. There's a lot going on. Yes. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.